This is Scott. This is Stephen. And this is the Poppable Podcast, where we share proven strategies and talk with industry experts to help you grow your pop up business. Galio Bustani, thank you so much for joining Scott and myself on the Poppable Podcast. It's a delight to have you on here. Thank you so much, Steve and Scott. I'm so happy to be joining across the continent. Yeah, because you're actually in, you're in Paris right now, correct? I am in France, right? And it has been a pleasure like using technology these days to, to connect with people. So I'm really delighted we're doing this. So I, I just want to give people the kind of backstory on how we met. You, you reached out to me a, a while back under your Instagram handle at Huckster, which I'm going to ask you to explain to people in, in a moment. And then we did a, a, a very live interview, which scared the bejesus out of me, I've got to be honest, ab about pop-up retailing. And, and then you very kindly sent me your book, Ephemeral Retailing Pop-Up Stores in a Postmodern Consumption Era, which I have to say, I think is the first academic piece of literature I've found about pop-up retailing. So thank you for producing this. And it's a, it's an incredible read. Uh, first of all, d explain for people what, what was the motivation behind writing the book? What brought you to, to, to produce this? It's a long story, maybe dating back to a decade when I was doing my master's degree in London. I we were asked to choose a topic of which we're going to write on our dis dissertation. And it was like the beginning of the recession that year. And I was taking the tube that morning and I took a paper and a, a piece on pop-up stores was, was there. And I was really intrigued. So I went to that store and it was really something. Me who always loved retail and loved taking pictures everywhere in different stores, markets, high streets, etc. I thought like, this is the topic I want to study. And I started my dissertation on that in 2010, but life happened and I had to go back home where I taught a little bit in universities and I worked on several consultancy projects. But the idea of doing a PhD has always stayed on my mind. So in 2014, I had the opportunity to pursue my PhD. And of course, the topic was much related to pop-up stores and pop-up retailing. And this is, was my first like debut in taking pop-up stores in, in an academic way and translating the love of, of pop-up retail in an academic sense. Sometimes I'm asked, why do, do I choose the world ephemeral and not always adopt the term pop-up? Because ephemeral sure. retailing is the fact that this type of retail does not stay for long. But the term pop-up has also the characterizing feature of popping up and having the surprise effect. At a certain point, I've noticed, and we've discussed this with Steve, that most people confuse the, the short-term aspect of retail with pop-up stores and directly like diffuse or dilute one term with the other. So I wanted to separate things and make more sense in the terms that we use and the realities that are being applied on the market. Cool. So th through the book, you've documented the history of pop-up retailing. And from all kinds of things, including Crystal Palace, the erection of that great piece of architecture, and then they took it down. And, and, and until I read your book, I never really considered the, the Crystal Palace exhibition to have been ephemeral retailing or marketing it, it, in that way. What, one of the things that struck me, though, and, and I'm going to quote from the book here, is you say pop-up stores rely on communications in order to gain momentum. They carefully plan their messages during their three communication stages. Do you, do you want to explain what those three communication stages are? Yes, sure. But let me also say that sometimes when we write, it's because we get inspired by someone or some aspect. I got hold of a book that was published maybe in 1923 that is called The Romance of Commerce and that Harry Golden Selfridge has written. And I had to wait like on eBay for several months to get hold of that. <laughs> and wow. it's a book like that. Wow. It's thick. 
and it narrates Gordon's memoirs of retail, etc. And of course, this inspired me a lot because I have always had this love of narrating or writing down a retail journal, which was a bit weird at a certain point, but then made a lot of sense. So I'm taking that journal and moving into those um, steps I tried to bring together related to the history of this ephemeral phenomenon. Yes, the mm -hmm. Eiffel Tower was supposed to be ephemeral and the Crystal Palace was supposed to be ephemeral. And then all of these circuses and traveling markets were supposed to be ephemeral as well. But every time uh, an, a happening or an event comes and wants to take place, there always has been a kind of word spreading and telling people like something is coming, something is going to happen. And, and people love to, to share words. And I believe that this form of, of communications and media never ceased to surprise us. And at the beginning of the century, we relied a lot on illustrations and posters and putting them everywhere on the streets to take the word out there. So this is an important step now if I like move all of these ideas to the concept of pop-up retailing. Pop-up retailing relies on that idea of what's happening. Like people are curious to know what's going to be there. We know that more brands are communicating their pop-up stores before that they appear, but they communicate just something about the event, but do not reveal the entire event. This is one phase that arises people's curiosity to come to the pop-up store. Once the, the event takes place and happens, the brand also is an obligation to keep communicating about things that are happening in C2, because this is really important to tell people that every, every single day or single hour, something is happening here. So don't lose uh, your interest, keep coming. And why not come tomorrow? Because tomorrow we're going to be seeing something else. And the third phase is the after phase. It's saying to our customers, thank you that you came and shared this beautiful moment with us. And here are some things that we, we did and we did with you. And here are some comments that we want to share with you. So the post is also important as the pre and the during and should keep this momentum alive as much as possible. Absolutely. I, I love the way you say that they, they have an obligation to communicate that because I think you're right. That's how it, uh, certainly modern retailers want to be kept informed and uh, or, or, or keep, keep their customers informed and consumers want that contact as well. So I think that plays an immense part in the success, doesn't it? Yes, and I really stress on that because considering the aspect of transparency and authenticity with our customers, we have to show them what's really happening and allow them to take part of that by contributing also with their posts and shares, etc. There's always a hashtag somewhere in a pop-up store, <laughs> like hanging on a wall or down a poster or on a screen. And there are always like technological outputs, either a camera allowing us to take picture with the background, posting it on social media, sharing it and so on. So these things ha are, did not happen haphazardly. We have to take advantage of all of these because we need to tell customers that we are authentically doing something different and they merit the, the time that we allow them to share with us and with others about their experience with us. There's certainly a lot of nuggets that we can drive from historical and academic literature related to businesses that we're in. You can find some old concepts that really can be reinvented for our present day that can make a big difference. So in that idea, is there from our brands and our leasing agents that would be listening to this podcast? What could they expect to take away from reading your book? The first book that uh, Steve has between his hands now is academic, like purely academic, as it takes many um, literature on the store atmospheres and then tries to find resemblance with pop-up store atmospheres. So it's okay. important to go back to the essence of things. Theory is always important, but it helps us reflect and criticize whether that theory 
And that application from a decade or two ago is still relevant today, or if not, how can we make the most of it uh, during relevant times? Today, most of us, when we conceive uh, a store's atmosphere, we think of an entrance, we think of a decompressing zone, we think of an immersive theatrical, we think of the roots of the customers, like how they want to be dwelling inside the store. Are they going to stop or not? Are they going to create their own experience or not? All of these elements are really important and they are there in literature, whether professional or academic. Now, how can we make use of all of these and put them at the service of pop stores and what can be added on to the pop-up store context to make our stores more experiential. I believe the question today related to pop-up stores is to what extent we need to reinvent or rethink our store atmospheric designs to make them more experiential because the term experiential in my opinion today is still unexploited and unclear in in physical aesthetic way i don't know if i if i am being able to <laughs> explain this uh, clearly but i believe that the experiential part of the pop-up source atmosphere has to be looked at uh, more thoroughly does that relate to retail life cycle theory and how does it play in or maybe explain what retail life cycle theory is. I talk about the retail life cycle theory in my second book, as I wanted to say that most of us believe that pop-up stores are the new things happening today in retail. However, pop-up stores might have existed as the first type of uh, retail outlets that ever existed. When people used to go and get their silks, spices, or wines, and they used to go from village to village, this is the pop <laughs> event <laughs> that, that customers could be looking at the time. And then retail settled and took more form into commercial areas, zones, high streets, and then we moved into uh, the city centers and out of city centers, etc. So retail evolved. And within that retail format, whether it is a boutique or, I don't know, vacant store or any type of format, it would evolve. It has a life cycle. It might start as an idea, grow, mature, and then we will milk that retail format success to the end. And all of a sudden, it might not be as relevant anymore. So if you see like the cycle of retail evolution in terms of format, might be circular and at each time there are mini circles that can respond to each format's growth as well. So what I meant to say that again, adopting from all of these theories, the pop-up store might not be the new thing. Today its application is new and the way we are applying it vis-a-vis -vis other retail formats gives a little bit of spice and excitement to the retail environment. And then I would say, what's going to be next? Are we going to be always excited about pop-up stores or are we going to be needing uh, physical formats again? It's like really related to our human behaviors and what we like or need. It, it, it's interesting that you talk about all retail came from pop-up retailing, which effectively it has. As we move forward with different concepts and we're seeing digital retailers now and, and, and digital environments where people literally do micro activations for just a few hours, what do you see as the future for ephemeral retailing and, and, and pop-ups? I believe that the high street will always be repainted as people want that excitement, but it does not mean that it will completely dilute or, or take out all of the other existing formats as well. It's really interesting today to think of pop-up stores as like these perfect agile formats that could come in handy and fill in the empty spaces at each time and renovate, give life or uh, decorate our high streets and malls. Whether it is for a couple of days or a couple of hours, it's really thinking of any format that the brand wants to adopt that would be relevant to the target audience. And so if I'm going to answer that question, I would only think let's pay more attention to our audience, to their touch points and see what they are doing throughout the day. And if we want to pop up, let's pop up in during the time and space 
that makes the most sense for them during that day in order for it to have that elevated reflection on things that like happen at the right time and that just make sense for them. I believe that this is like the future today. So do you think pop-up should be restricted to traditional kind of retailing areas, high streets, malls, markets, or I, I believe that you could be taking these out into office blocks and residential blocks and so on. What's your take on that? This is exactly what I, I would see it. You have seen lately in the UK that a, a company, like an organization called Souk, is taking yep. like the high street by storm. And I had the chance to talk a little bit to uh, the CEO. And like this perfectly uh, goes within that logic. Today, if you're in an office or a big building and you have a canteen and you have an hour for your lunch break, a sports brand could come and uh, suggest like a yoga class or a stretching class, like to decompress mm. with the audience, not necessarily with the objective of selling something, but just by doing that, uh, the individual would stick that brand to the back of their minds. And whenever they're doing their shopping, they will be thinking about it. So they have popped up like, and then let's, concentrate on all of these concerts that are going to happen or happening. And just when people are flocking in a kiosk or a, an inflatable balloon or a hangar that could be placed at the entrance or the exit is a perfect solution. Summer is here, go to the beach. It's winter, go to the skiing station. We should not only be restricted to our high street and the empty boutique because this is good and the mall is good but yet again think about the restrictions related to space and going outside and creating your own this is the essence of of, of pop-up stores at the end of the day so go crazy Absolutely. <laughs> do you see any underlying differences in the way that pop-ups are conducted being over in europe and france and and maybe even looking at the uk compared to the u.s do you see any underlying differences of how things are being operated or concepts that maybe are not being adopted in different areas? Of course, this always could be a, a point of view. And I, as an academic, sometimes I don't want to be very conclusive. However, I had the chance <laughs> to study the Middle Eastern market and the European market. And I could say that, yes, there are lots of difference between countries and sometimes within one country, between uh, villages, areas, or departments. So first of all, um, staying on the European continent, pop-up stores arrive a bit later in France than they did in the UK. We started looking at pop-up stores in France six or seven years ago. And if we look at France and as isolate that market, I want to say 90% today of pop-up stores are concentrated in Paris and not in the Parisian area and not in Paris, in some quarters of the Parisian city, which is interesting to look at. And then you would see that maybe culturally it has also something to do with the way we, we could portray our brands and how customers could handle that. In the UK, a pop-up stores tend to be more theatrical. It is only a couple of years ago that friends started looking at some brands and some pop-up store applications that are like crazy as a pop-up should be. And then going to the Middle East, and I would say quickly, pop-up stores have matured in some countries and not the others. Going further down the Gulf, in Dubai, pop-up stores could follow some aspects uh, related to European or American standards. However, if you come closer to Lebanon, for example, pop-up stores are more of events to put forward products and sell them. Even if an international brand, I don't want to name brand, does a pop-up store, it <laughs> would do a party and some uh, exhibitional events, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it has to transcribe into a sales. And finally, in these countries, pop-up stores are social events. It's like going out, meeting the girls, meeting our group, taking photos. And at the end, we might think of a product that is there. Oh yeah, it's nice, I would buy it. 
And in Europe, you might be looking more of places that could offer like interesting collections that might be unique and I want to grasp. So you see that the pop-up is there, but then the application really relates to the culture and to the geography, location, etc. Our listeners know that finding the right brands, spaces, markets, and yes, even service providers is critical for your pop-up success. Through the poppable.com community marketplace, finding the right partners for your next pop-up venture is fun, fast, and efficient. Gain access to a wide network of opportunities with Poppable Match, the incredible matching platform that connects you with the perfect brands and spaces for your next pop-up. Collaborate, discover new locations, and negotiate your next deal. Join us today on the poppable.com community marketplace. How has your research changed or impacted your thinking on retail? At first, and I, it, maybe it dates back 10 years or 15 years ago, I was so young and ambitious. And I always thought that throughout my professional experience, it was really important to corroborate with academic information. So I would go sometimes buy some books and come to my manager and tell him, we're doing like this today in the store. However, I was not welcome whenever I came on with these uh, comparisons because I was treated as being like purely academic or sometimes very conceptual. But I didn't really let this issue go because I pursued the educational part throughout my career. And my first PhD interview comes. So apparently they liked the idea that I wanted to study pop-up stores. But throughout the interview, everything was perfect. I remember even thinking of every option that they might ask of me. But then the board finished every question. And one member of the board who was heading the board told me, Ghalia, why do you want to do the PhD? I told her because I want to bridge the academic world with the professional world. And the rejection letter came in. And they told me, Kanya, you are not ready to do your PhD because <laughs> oh, you cannot no. bridge. <laughs> 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 and you can imagine that sweet face, like crying all night because it was like a shame. I oh, prepared so much for that interview. But then again, I had uh, reapplied for that school and this time the interview went very well. Unfortunately, I couldn't study due to financial reasons. It was very expensive to study in Europe and doing a PhD was even more expensive. However, I had the opportunity like to go on and pursue my PhD with another university. But then, I mean, it's really important uh, for us to keep an open eye on the professional uh, world because this is our source of information. Most of researchers follow like schools when doing research. I, for myself, I start always by the ground and move up. I would always take a lot of time doing interviews, observations or ethnographic observations to understand what's happening before trying to test any relationship between an element and the other. So I believe that the professional aspects give a lot of richness for us and then give us lots of material to criticize later on. This is what I have been doing. And I really believe that keeping an eye open on the professional world really helps me rethink my academic criticism or opinion, if I might say. So, so what, what's on the horizon for you going forward, Galia? So I would uh, be like working further on academic publications at this stage. It might take a little bit of time. It really depends on the context. And another uh, book is coming along the way. This one has like a purely professional take on the retail scene and questions uh, retail practices today and tries to give professionals uh, a way to open their eyes, asking questions to ask more questions. It's raising mm -hmm. issues to raise more issues. 
And the idea of the book really came out of all of these comments I used to have from clients when working with professionals or consultancy projects. And I wanted to put forward all of these questions to, to make more sense of realities and unrealities of the retail world that we might be living in today. And I hope that it comes out as a beautiful piece. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure it will. We, we can't let you go without asking you about your Instagram handle, which is at Huckster. And, and you very kindly explained it to me when I asked you about it when we did our interview. But maybe for our popable listeners, you, you, you might like to explain that. So Huckster was born maybe seven years ago, but it had a different name related to a different company that I used to have uh, in the Middle East. When I moved to France, I thought it would be better to refresh the identity and change the name. So I was thinking of the name. I was thinking about the idea of retail and retail growth. And I started jotting down some ideas that I have to find that paper, Steve, because it's like a big board of <laughs> ideas. What <laughs> could portray the idea of retail's development? And then I found that term that I wasn't acquainted with at the time, which is Huxter means or defines the person who travels from door to set something. Most of the times it could hold like negative connotations as being the person who might not uh, do the commerce in an ethical way. However, I liked <laughs> the idea of the name and I adopted it for that page. And on Huxter, I tried to, to share as much as I can information about pop-up stores and pop-up retail and inject everything that relates to the world of pop-up retail, whether in terms of services, branding, marketing, etc., to make more value uh, and more sense of the content that I'm sharing. And maybe it started last year during the pandemic. I said, I have to go and speak with people who are uh, professionals and experts in the retail field and who would know about pop-up retail. And I started doing uh, those live shows to really focus on the idea of pop-up retailing. Excellent. Excellent. At <laughs> Huckster, everybody, you should go check it out. It's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great page. At Huckster underscore FR. <laughs> FR, correct. Oh, yes, yes. That's right. <laughs> Thank that's you, right. Steve. <laughs> Thank you. Golly, I really appreciate you being on our podcast today and uh, sharing your insights from your research. I, I, I just wanted to add, add it, it's always a delight. We've grown to know each other since we did our interview and continually learning from you, which is fabulous. So thank you for the knowledge and the education that you share with everybody. Thank you for that. Thank you Absolutely. so much. I'm humbled. And it was a pleasure uh, chatting with you today and look forward to meeting you on other occasions. Thanks for listening to the Poppable Podcast. If you have any questions for the show, you can email us at questions at poppablepodcast.com or leave a voice recording at poppablepodcast.com. Don't forget to review, share and subscribe and we'll both see you next time on the Poppable Podcast. <laughs>